Hello everyone, Simon here from the Wales of Wall Street. We have an exciting topic interview video for you today. Dr. Vivek from Power Ledger will be joining us and we'll be discussing the fusion of blockchain and artificial intelligence coming together for the energy sector. Um, now we talk about the energy sector in general quite a lot on the channel, especially with the orientation around blockchains use through that. Um, but this takes it a bit to another level of kind of like different algorithms that are being used, uh, particularly power ledger solutions to this area. And we just have a general topic discussion as well about compliance, the regulation aspects of what's going on, what the future holds for the energy sector with these kind of orientations of ecosystems as well. Um, and you know, this, this is very much a massive topic really. Uh, we see across the news many, many times over the years and particularly right now, of course, bill hikes galore all over the world. Um, and the fact that the energy sector is going into a very renewable state. Um, and of course, a lot of that needs transparency. And for us as users, whether we become prosumers or not is another question in the next few years. Of course, we will talk about that as well in the video. But all of these things orientate around the fact that the technology is here and Power Ledger is one of those that forefront it for sure. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I hope you enjoy what is being discussed in this video. So I'll leave you to it to listen through this and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, one great to have you here. I'm delighted to introduce you to Vivek uh, from Power Ledger. Absolutely uh, great to have you on here, Vivek. So welcome. Um, it'd be great if you could spend a bit of time just uh, introducing yourself and your relation to Power Ledger and a bit about your background as well. Sure. So uh, my name is Vivek Bandari. At the moment, I'm joining from Perth, Western Australia. Uh, my background is, tip, I'm by heart a technologist, and I've been working in the software for most of my life, uh, and in, in particular, things like, uh, you know, blockchain, AI, uh, you name it, like the, the tech comes and goes, but uh, tech is, is in, the, uh, in the center. But in particular with tech, uh, my focus has always been in sustainability, energy, environment, so ap applying tech to these industries. Uh, relationship with Power Ledger. So it was about middle of 2020 and I was heading the software business for Siemens for a, a couple of uh, countries, Australia, New Zealand, and a few others. And I was looking into Western Australia and Power Ledger was based out of Western Australia. So that's how I started collaborating with Power Ledger. We did a couple of tenders and a few other things. And then I uh, I left uh, uh, Siemens and joined Power Ledger from Jan 2022. So for uh, at the moment I, at at that time I joined as a head of uh, market optimization, and uh, in about like in a couple of months I took the role of the CTO, meaning covering all of tech and products uh, for Power Ledger. Uh, at that time, the company was mostly based out of uh, Western Australia. So everything was happening in Western Australia. And then we had uh, staff uh, in, in different parts of the world and projects in different parts of the world. But yeah, then I started looking into like how, how to optimize all of this, how to create a team, uh, not just in Western Australia, but a global team. And yeah, and then ever since I've been on that. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we, we cover Power Ledger quite a lot on the channel. Um, so for those that need uh, kind of like a full introduction, um, we have a couple of videos that I will link at the end of this one for sure. Um, my main focus really today uh, with yourself, Vivek, is um, as many of the audience know, uh, we also cover um, the relation to blockchain essentially with so many other different technologies that have very much advanced significantly over the last few years um predominantly the likes of 5g artificial intelligence of course a massive buzzword for the last year or so and and will be continuously moving forward um there's um something that power ledger launched the hybrid i'm gonna have to read this bit so i'll make sure i get it right the hybrid weighted energy forecasting algorithm now i found this fascinating when i read into it a bit more depth so as I said, like the integration of all these different technologies and particularly with blockchain right now, could you talk a bit more about the orientation 
of the artificial intelligence aspect and blockchain within the energy sector particularly and, and using that algorithm? Because it's quite fascinating. Sure. So first, I think we, we can start with the AI itself, right? So the history of AI is very old. Uh, and But the use of AI in computer is recent, but recent from a sense like in late 1950s, right? When, uh, when, when they officially started looking into AI. So, but, and then it has gone through like lots of boom and bust uh, uh, cycles uh, for, for several years now. But then recently in after the 2020s with chat GPT and, uh, you know, where AI became accessible to everyday you and me, so it started gaining momentum. And the way I see this AI is more like, uh, you know, uh, the technology, uh, the the internet era in the oh. 93, 94 type era. So we, we uh, I see like uh, this AI, this especially with large language models and generative AI today, 24, 25, 26 is probably like 94, 95 of uh, the internet era. And now that being said, uh, a lot of AI is emerging and, uh, but in the energy side, the use of AI is is not new. So AI was used in the past. So if you look into, you know how things are controlled uh, and how things are optimized, you, you use uh, a, a lot of AI. But the only difference is that because it's a critical infrastructure, generally these things are so you are not allowed or AI is not allowed to make a final decision yet. Sure. So it it just becomes like you know the the guide. But the decision, there is a human intervention in the middle, and then the human makes that uh, makes that decision. Now, particularly with with the recent AI thing, if you look into the large language models, and then I'll I'll slowly go into blockchain yeah. and uh, our, our algorithm too. So with these large models, uh, AI suffers a bit in a sense because you know there are these biases. You don't know what you are training uh, training it with. Uh, you know, and and the way you train it, the output is more. It's more like the neurons are connected based on the the, the training data, right? So, so that being said, there is uh, a lot of uh, opacity in with uh, today's AI, and especially these large models and who controls them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is this aspect of you know, uh, I was talking to uh, a few folks uh, in the US a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying like, oh, we like there is this huge trend in the US at the moment where none of the big companies want to look into chat GPT anymore. They want their GPT, but you know, they want their own GPT because you don't sure. know what it's been trained off. And, 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 and it, it just comes down to, do you trust them? And blockchain brings that trustworthiness, right? So blockchain brings that trustworthiness in a sense, uh, where did my data come? come from it came from here there is this provenance you can track you can even not just the behavior of uh, everyday you and me you can even track the provenance of the electron that is mm-hmm. being generated mm-hmm. so with that uh you know i can i can kind of see a a, a future uh, and 2024 onwards and and lots of uh, big organizations are kind of look, seeing the same so i just uh, want to quote like uh, a report where a survey that was done and over 70% of the organizations saw, like big ones, saw that there is synergy between blockchain and AI. They see them as complementary uh, technologies and complementary in a sense that one is one produces and does the magic, but other provides that uh, auditability and provenance tracking and, and they go hand in hand. Now, that being said, uh, what we developed uh, in, in this uh, particular AI algorithm is uh, and before before I go there, I need to explain uh, our principle, right? So, and it, where it fits. So we are a strong believer of decentralization, and and in decentral uh, system, particularly with the markets that don't exist today uh, in many parts of the world, and a market where you and I can trade our energy, and maybe you know we exchange in uh, in return for that DiCaprio picture on on <laughs> on, on your wall yeah. or something even beers you know like it could be any commodity that you can exchange sure. so that's the future and but to get to that future we need these uh, technologies which will be able to predict your pattern how you're going to behave how I'm going to behave uh, how my energy is is going to be consumed how do I turn on and turn off so this particular algorithm, 
was created for peer-to-peer -peer trading where you and I can trade. And what it does is it takes inputs as your patterns and my patterns and predict how our future most likely would look like and what what, what is that used for. So you use that information to uh, to tell your bot how you should bid tomorrow or your bot would decide how it would bid tomorrow. Right. So it looks at your past and then predicts your future uses by looking at the prices, by looking at your consumption, uh, looking at uh, if you have a local generation, looking at your generation and so on. So it's uh, yeah, that, that's why. And then you can give, your, give weight. So that's why we said uh, hybrid weighted. So you can give weights on where you want it to focus on versus where mm -hmm. not. And there are multiple parameters. So that hence the hybrid weighted. And uh, again, summing up, you know, AI blockchain and what this algorithm is, is it kind of, uh, I would say just a starting point to bring blockchain and AI together. And and then uh, from here, you know, it's, it's just limitless. You can imagine, say, 10 years from now where my computer uh, has a bot and that bot is an ai powered bot that uh, takes into account every parameter that belongs to me it looks into the market price and and sometimes these things can be crazy right so it takes it 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 puts the best foot out for you for every iot device that you have your computer your phone your charger they kind of synergize amongst one another and and participate in the market seamlessly and that ai does it all that data is in the blockchain so you've got th that immense auditability and and the audit trail and uh, the transactions happens the settlement happens in the chain and uh, the communications happens in the 5g you know so all of these things 5g 6g whatever is the g uh, at that time right so so fast communication uh, blockchain uh, intelligence and to support uh, human and uh, the energy transition so that's pretty much uh, where it's headed that's amazing i think just the the infusion for a better word or the yeah. fusion of of these technologies together i think it's going to be really exciting i think it's just so early anyway um i'm very fortunate to go to certain events that um you know i meet certain government officials particularly here in the uk um who are working on frameworks uh around crypto around blockchain around ai and it's it's is really weird because um you know for decades you you tend to have these huge gaps of technology or technology gaps and and literally in these last couple of years of course when something starts it tends to accelerate and it's it's really fascinating to see that uh there's a big drive a big topic around um you know blockchain you know in, in general around the world you know 90 percent of the world might not even know they're using blockchain it's just there whereas ai is a bit more in your face in a sense it's been talked a lot about in the media quite recently um which kind of leads me on to my next point really do you see any kind of existing barriers at the moment um when it comes to the use of uh the ai side of things particularly with energy and and you touched on just a moment ago about the peer-to-peer -peer trading aspect now in the past um this has had a big conversation around it over over many years as well um and i suppose more in, inclined with the fact that power ledger has a peer-to-peer -peer trading opportunity in front of you and here in the uk we've got they, well, they called it the energy bill. We're not talking about bills that we get through the post, the actual uh, act and law that's going through at the moment. It doesn't actually insinuate blockchain directly, but it does have um, insinuations in those documents at the moment uh, as they're talking about it more and more about the AI introduction, the compliance and the legalities of peer-to-peer sorry, peer to peer as well. Do, do you see any barriers at the moment? What do you think needs to happen over the next few years for this to become a reality for everyone? And I know prosumer is obviously a big word out there as well. So it's really interesting to get your take on that. Yeah, so regulation and education. Mm. But then let's go backwards uh, is a short answer. But let's go backwards yep. on what's happening in the UK and, uh, you know, and, and are, are things happening in the positive direction? I would say yes. Uh, so UK, particularly in peer-to-peer -peer trading, you know, you've been trying peer-to-peer -peer for a couple of years now, uh, from around like 2017-18 with the EDS uh, and, and a few others. And uh, these projects are there, the benefits are there. 
I remember talking to a few uh, folks uh, from uh, Manchester and, uh, you know, and, and where the conversation went was, we see the benefits. We see, we see all of these benefits. It's been already proven. But what we need now is we need to take them uh, and make them commercial. And to make them commercial, what we need is regulation. And talking to this particular, uh, talking about this particular bill and, and the other things that are happening in the UK, uh, for example, you've got this powering up Britain, which is, you know, net zero by 2050 and uh, economic growth and, and a few other things, right? So if you need to be net zero by 2050, and if you need to do, you would need to orderly integrate the renewables. You w- don't want to just bring uh, renewables and assume that things will happen by magic. It, it won't. Uh, you, and by orderly integration, uh, take an example of Western Australia. Mm-hmm. The largest power plant in Western Australia here are rooftop solar mm. combined. And it's in orders of magnitude bigger than the largest, another, the second largest. So so the, the penetration is already happening. It, it will yeah. happen now. It will happen in two years. It will happen in a couple of years. But what the government is kind of uh, n- not able to grapple much is how do you, how do you integrate it in, in a more sustainable fashion? And, and a quick thing that comes to mind is, you know, when you need renewables, all these wind blows where it blows. So you need to build transmission lines, uh, sun signs where it signs probably in the desert. So, you know, you build transmission lines, but think about uh, roads, right? So if just adding highways would alleviate congestion, yep, there would be no congestion in LA, no congestion in Texas, <laughs> nothing, right? So just adding highways wouldn't wouldn't alleviate that. Yes, you need more highways, more wider lanes, but more, aka more transmission at some point. But what you also need is you need to have people uh, or not commute as much come with a walkable city. Similarly, in the energy side, come with something that you can share and trade and, and, and do this in a close proximity because there are these pockets where this can happen. And I, I went into and I looked into the UK, the energy bill, and I was uh, looking at uh, the, the volume 737 to be precise. And I'll, I'll quote a gentleman, uh, you know, and uh, I, I, uh, uh, Dave Dugan from Scotland. And uh, what he is saying is it's patently obvious that any just transition to net zero is simply not possible if local communities cannot sell energy they produce to a local consumer. It's absolutely fundamental and he's right with that, right? So meaning for this transition to happen, the school should be able to buy this electricity from everyday you and me, from Mm -hmm. the mom and pop who are sending their kids to the school. The brewery, we've got a very interesting project here in Australia where uh, VB, uh, Victoria Bitter, what they do is they buy uh, electricity from you and me and pay back in cartons of beer. So, right. you know, you could sell uh, electricity to a school in a similar fashion. Probably uh, you don't, uh, you get paid in, in, uh, in, in some other means. So there are so many business models, like once you start connecting, there is this network effect that will happen, right? So a lot of business models will appear and, and a lot of things will happen. But for those to happen, what we need is we, we need more uh, and very clear regulation. A very good example uh, from a place where we wouldn't think that there is a regulation like that there, uh, Uttar Pradesh in India. So they okay. passed a regulation saying, you have to utilities you have to go and do blockchain based peer to peer period okay wow and everyday people needs to be able to trade industries can buy from uh, everyday people uh, uh, instead of buying from the grid you can buy and sell your excess uh, across just go ahead and do it and create ma- create such mandates uh, a very loose uh, sort of flimsy i would say is a uh, clean energy package in europe where they do envision energy communities and you know where where this trade is sharing and trading could ha- could happen but we need to we need to go uh, top down the benefits are there right so the benefits are there it's very clear if you are a prosumer and uh, typically you today you don't oversize your solar because there are, there are no buyers right so only a little amount maybe 20 30% spills into the grid but if you had benefits, you'll probably oversize a bit. 
But sure. even even if you don't say you are spilling 20, 30 percent in, into the grid, uh, depending on where you are at, either you have a punitive measure like you don't get paid anything, your inverter is curtailed or you are you are paid like a very tiny amount as a feed in tariff or some sort of tariff. Right. So if you have a buyer uh, who would be willing to buy at a slightly higher price and mm-hmm. we've done mm-hmm. numerous projects, commercial or otherwise, to show that there will be a buyer who would be willing to buy at a higher price, you are better off. Right. I, as a buyer, imagine in this situation, I'm buying your electricity. I will be better off because I don't have to pay for these transmission distribution charges yes. that the utility is, is, is charging and just hiking. I'm just paying for the energy, right? So uh, in, in a very not, uh, small nutshell. So I'm making for profit there. You are making profit there. The utility has to evolve and change their business model. So instead of becoming like a wholesaler who buys in bulk and sells and, and uh, adds margin, now utility come and make margin if you need to when these peers trade because you're providing that infrastructure mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know you need to find something else to uh, to make money from. And, and, and that's the type of decentral model where we are headed. And to go there, we need to leapfrog. Now, this particular bill that I was talking and uh, what I quoted I've not tracked with this energy bill, like what clauses are in and yeah. what clauses are out. I know, I know, it's it's in the form of a law already. But again, uh, what we need is we we need more disruption and mm-hmm. and more connection amongst the people. And once we have these connections and more more disruptions, then you would have these. Uh, you know, naturally it comes. So take an example why was apple invented unrelated but related example right so in uh in america there is this guy steve jobs who's sitting he meets steve wozniak who knows how to do computers and then they meet other two or three people and and it emerges right so when you start connecting people new business models emerge new things emerge and that's that's what we need in this archaic and dinosaur energy industry and and that's what blockchain ai all of these would provide a good example is there is uh, in in europe uh, in you have you now have a regulation on hydrogen that you can only claim that a hydrogen is green if it has been produced by using renewables at the same yep. time from the same grid you need a provenance you need to put that into blockchain. Only then you can track that provenance and claim the greenness of that hydrogen, right? So we need those kind of things uh, now to make this transition happen. And uh, and again, AI, it, it's uh, you can use AI anywhere. And with these large language models, uh, energy industry is just sitting on the fence. They use AI as an example to predict what transformer fails. It's, it's mm-hmm. a very, very mm-hmm. much used case, right? So where... Uh, but they can use AI in everyday, everyday operations. So, uh, for example, when a utility operates, a distribution utility, majority of the time, in even in the most advanced countries, when a tree falls in front of your house, the way they know is when you call them. They don't sure. even have a measurement. <laughs> okay, so you call and I call, and then oh, they have a model that you and I are south of a transformer. Maybe the outage is in that transformer, right? So maybe we should send the crew there. You can train the shit, sorry about the word, right? So you can train this AI and and come up with really good results to save money. Like you don't need to send people to random places and search where where this event happened. You know, distribution utility, you live and die by these indices called... Steady, KD, KFI, and and so on, right? So how long was my outage there, right? Mm. So if you if you want, write this data in blockchain and make it and like transparent to everyone. Like you're not tweaking, you're you're not doing anything. Put this data in the chain, and everybody knows. Like you know, uh, and and then that justifies your bonuses that you're giving. So it's it's very uh, you know all of these technologies. I I see them coming. It's still at infancy. But in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years, uh, this is going to be the future. That's brilliant. I think the disruption of crypto and blockchain anyway in the last few years, you you made a good valid point of when there is disruption, things have to change very quickly in the dynamics of compliance and regulation. 
and that has sped up significantly in in those those particular areas but i think for the energy sector of course is a huge market value and they know what technologies are coming it's almost like we've had a bit of a warning of we need to sort this out now before it's too late get it ready um and it kind of brings me on to on to the next question or the next point really because i read your awesome article again i'm gonna have to read the title so i don't get it wrong igniting a revolution unleashing web3 loyalty programs across utility sectors so of course at the moment with bill hikes and everything like this going on and we're trying to reduce the bills uh the loyalty aspects and everything like that could you maybe um elaborate a bit further on that article and, and what that means in terms of the energy hikes and the bill chaos and things that are all going on right now that we see in the news every day sure so energy sector utility sector is regulated right and uh even when the market is contestable uh you still have some sort of a monopoly uh let's take an example we've we've talked uh, quite a bit about the UK, maybe this time the US, right? So sure. Minnesota in the US, you've got a majority of the customers are supplied by Excel Energy. And uh, it's a regulated monopoly. What that means is the utility commission uh, caps how much you can charge, but it's a monopoly. So when you have these sorts of monopolies, uh, and they happen in a lo lot of different places, there is very little innovation that happens because, you know, if a house gets built, that utility will be responsible for providing uh, service to that house. The fight would be like, what is that price and what is the right price where, you know, the regulator don't want to overregulate so that the company becomes bankrupt. The, the utility uh, uh, wants to charge more, but uh, they shouldn't charge a lot more so that their execs don't go in helicopters to eat lunch, right? So that it's just a fine balance yeah. there. But when you have competition, a, a lot of things, uh, a lot of things happen. And whether it's a competition or whether it's not a competition, all of these utilities have lots of customers, and the customers, the power of the customer is not used at the moment. This, mm. these customers are just takers. You know, uh, whether it is Excel Energy or Synergy in Western Australia or uh, Tata Power in India, right? So they, all of them have uh, from hundreds of thousands of customer millions in, in, in a lot of, uh, lot of cases. But all their customers do is take that electricity and maybe some will generate some electricity and then the utility is forced to buy, right? So, but that's about the interaction that they have. Now, Think as airlines. Mm. So in airlines, uh, airlines also has a lot of customers. Uh, now, most of these airlines make money not by flying planes, but they make money by the loyalty programs that they have, by running mm. the businesses around the loyalty program, right? So, or, or, and what, what is that? you interact and you do this, you'll get these points and then those points you can exhaust there and so on. Like in a plain vanilla web two sense. Now, how about we apply this and make it more dynamic and interactive within the utility sector, electricity mm -hmm. utility, they already have this captive audience and, and where there is competition, uh, you, it's, it's an excellent tool to gain more. So what you can do is say you are a utility in Austria and uh, you have all these customers and you want to acquire more customers, you can start a utility loyalty program, a Web3 loyalty program where you want to incentivize people for turning on and off. Why not uh, use token tokenomics, use your tokens, use uh, somebody else's tokens to uh, to incentivize people to take actions, energy efficiency, turning on their ACs, uh, for, or you can also use those tokens in an interesting way. So as an example, I've got excess rooftop solar. How about I, instead of getting that feed-in tariff, I create a token, uh, call it my green token, my personal green token, yep. and I use that token tomorrow to charge my car. So effectively, I'm using my renewables tomorrow and and I'm supporting the grid, right? So you can create all of these dynamic behaviors when you start embedding this blockchain and Web3 aspects to the utilities. And until now, they 
they don't normally do that. There are some progressive utilities uh, who try to try out things. Uh, and uh, But again, in a traditional Web2 sense, right? But there is so much you can un uncover and so much uh, business that you can yeah. create just by uh, unleashing that power. And that's, that's what I wrote in that article, you know, like... Uh, unleashing Web3 and creating loyalty programs for utilities, whether it's a monopoly, you can still do that, or it's a competitive and a, a contestable market, you can still do that. That's brilliant. I think uh, just tokenomics in general, uh, we talk about the, you know, the new upcoming economy of play to earn, eat to earn, learn to earn. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. not saying the wording is energy to earn, but that that principle is exactly right. I think it's it's an incentivization aspect. A lot of brands are coming into. I don't necessarily like using the word NFT anymore. You know, real world assets and the tokenization of something. I think energy is, um, a, pun intended, is it's a powerful aspect of, of what could be really achieved and essentially help to reduce um you know the emissions and things like this to to bring those those numbers down so it's, it, i'll leave a link to that article obviously in the description of this video i think it's a fascinating read um and yeah. thank you for sharing it with us as well um the last question vivek because i know zoom's telling me off at the moment it's running out um education wise not not necessarily about the energy sector in general i think that's quite clear for most people um what do you think needs to be done at a institutional or commercial level as well as consumer slash retail level as well in terms of the education about this aspect of energy being able to be tokenized the aspect of blockchain the ai aspect of it because yeah, that can branch off into many areas it could be like the developing the coding aspects of it it could be about what we need to do campaign wise from a government level from a community level what's your thoughts on that to wrap up this video so the community needs to understand what is possible, right? So that's where the education comes in. So we talked a lot about peer-to-peer. -peer. Take another example, uh, uh, renewable certificates or carbon credits. So for everyday consumer today, if I want to offset something, the only thing I can do is go in my airlines and say that I want to offset, right? So I don't know what's happening in the background, but you know I've got yeah. that. Eh, yeah. Maybe they are doing it. And yeah. I, I, I click that. So I have, I have no way to do that. It would be so amazing if I could be able to buy these tokenized credits in some marketplace, good quality credits. Mm. I can buy them today, but I need to know who these brokers are. And there are a handful of them. I need to talk with them and they'll not entertain me because I'm, I'm not uh, Google and I'm not uh, Microsoft, right? I'm just an everyday person. So sure. they'll not entertain me. If they don't entertain me, I need to open up registry accounts, which is tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> the, the economics don't work. So I, I can't do that. So I can't buy effectively. And I just have like, you know, I have this heart that, oh, I click there and I trust. So now it would be so amazing if the access could be tokenized and sold as micro recs, hmm. right? And and my, uh, so big recs are there, but micro recs are not there today. And micro recs from a low income community, amazing, right? So the next Olympic that is coming, the Olympic could buy its electricity from the low income uh, neighborhood. Why not? You, you are promoting, but why isn't this happening? Hmm. First, people are not even aware that this can yeah. happen. You know, we, we've got these, uh, again, I'm using the term dinosaur again, uh, institutions where we don't, we're the stakers. Hmm. We don't know what is possible. So the, and as soon as the people are aware that this is possible, there's no way of stopping it. Hmm. And the education and the campaigns should be focused on that. Like, hmm. look, this is possible. Try it out. And, and in cases where we have already tried out with the pilots and everything, then the next hurdle that we need is we need to buy, we need a buy-in of the central actor to make all of this possible. So in the environmental commodity space, I, it would be these brokers. Uh, in the energy space, it'll be the utilities. We need the buy-in of these actors. And again, they are not losing out. It's just that they need to understand that the game is changing and they need, they can be a part of this bigger change and still be profitable so there is this education to everyday people and there there are these there is this education to 
the central actors who can who hold and who are pivotal to make this mm. change happen that's brilliant yes yeah, uh, there's a long way to go um and i think more and more people do need to hear about this this opportunity um and i think it's going to accelerate as we've said with many of the other technology advancements across the board um it's it's one of those where when people do know about it it's going to accelerate for sure mm -hmm. so i'm really excited about the next few years certainly in the energy sector what we know about blockchain what we know about artificial intelligence and all the other aspects that we pulled into this um whole entire ecosystem is absolutely phenomenal um but yo, know, Vivek, I really massively appreciate you coming on the channel today and um, talking about all these really amazing topics. Um, definitely would love to have you on again in the near future, hopefully, if you if you would love to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, but sure. yeah, it's it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm I'm really excited about the developments of Power Ledger um and to have you on the channel as well. Um, so again, thanks very much for joining us. Um, and if there's anything else you want to say, um, but the floor is yours. No, I mean so I'll just repeat uh, kind of what I said in the beginning. So 2024, 2025 is the year of transformative synergy. So there will be more AI, there will be more uh, blockchain, there will be more traceability, there will be more smartness coming into this energy and environment space. We just need to uh, stay tuned. And there is this very bright future ahead of us. I'm excited. And I think Power Ledger, of course, is going to be a, a big forefront of this for sure. Um, Vivek, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, guys. Well, that was a fascinating interview uh, with Dr. Vivek. Massively appreciate him coming onto the channel to discuss uh, all things energy sector and the utilization of artificial intelligence blockchain i think it's absolutely fascinating insight to be honest um really in-depth conversation there hopefully you guys all enjoyed that um, and gives a bit more of an extra dimension as to all the things that we've discussed on the channel um so you know i like to think that i know what i'm talking about and obviously we talk about power ledger quite a bit on the channel as well in particular but for me having conversations like that do take it to another level and it gives a bit of an extra understanding. So we've kind of like got the introduction of Power Ledger already through previous videos and interviews. We talk about Power Ledger on a regular basis, but to have that kind of conversation, absolutely fantastic. And as I said, gives gives a bit more ammunition as to what's really going on behind the scenes and what's coming in the future. So to relate that to something in particular is when we talk about doing research about a company or a project that we're investing in, it's really important to not necessarily just understand the people that work within these companies, but what's the actual strategic goal here? What are they actually providing as a solution, as a service? Again, to us as potential consumers and users at the end, as well as the institutional commercial level. And once you understand the magnitude of the energy sector in general, and you understand that companies like Power Ledger, what they're doing, and that, that future stepping stone approach, all the other things coming in that we talked about, regulation, compliance, the technology aspects as well it really gets you excited as an investor but again it's that research aspect that's really important with whatever we do in this space and understanding it a lot more like what are we actually investing in and i think we've got a lot of really good answers there um, as to the whole complexity if you like for a better word of what's really going on in the background for the energy sector moving forward um, and I think it's really exciting. So that's that's kind of like why I'm, I'm invested and interested in this. I find it fascinating. I've always found the energy sector fascinating anyway. Um, even my uni days, I did my dissertations about the environmental impacts of things. And even back then, it was partially laughed at, like this isn't a serious topic. But here we are, 12, 15 years later, it's already becoming a significant topic. Uh, even to the days of when I was taken to uh, trade shows at Farmer Air Show near to us uh, by my dad who, who worked at uh, several different defense companies, I was seeing the first concepts as a child of wind turbines and things like this. And it was like, I don't know why, the wind turbine looked really interesting to me and there was like a little mini city built and how these wind turbines will power things. And, and that's how it kind of took off. So I think the education is definitely creeping in um for sure but 
we are missing a huge gap of education in regards to the technological advancements that are occurring and how we can be a part of this, whether it's being incentivized or certainly something that we as, as humans should be morally trying to achieve uh, collectively as well as individually. Uh, so it's a really good topic, a really good discussion. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We'll definitely get Dr. Vivek back on the channel as soon as possible. But I'm going to leave that there. I think it's a great wrap. And uh, thanks very much for watching. We'll see you in the next interview topic video. Take care. Bye-bye.